All right, everybody, welcome to The Revolution will be live streamed. We are live and I'm excited about today's guest. We're gonna be talking about the concept of living a permissionless life. And this guest is not just someone who's in the business of talking about it. He's in the business of living it every single day. The, today's guest is Victor Adams. Victor is a veteran of the finance industry and he is a self-described survivor of our franchise system. After spending over a decade working as a financial analyst and a regional director, he retired at age 43. The brother literally cashed out, retired at age 43. And among his many adventures, he has a recently debuted novel where he takes a satirical look at the legal system. So many great stories, so many great insights on retiring early and opting out of the system of living a life that you don't really love, that you aren't really passionate about. Please welcome today's guest, Victor Adams. Victor, thank you for joining us, man. Thank you guys for having me on today. <laughs> yeah, this is gonna be a hard episode because I feel like there are just so many directions this conversation can go in, so many questions I wanna ask you. I, I think I just wanna kick things off before we get into your story about how you retired. I wanna talk about the, the fiction novel because you working in finance, it's not it's not easy to predict that you would end up retiring and working in fiction. So what is your fiction book about? What inspired you to take on that kind of challenge? Well, you know, when I left the finance industry uh, with amazing timing in late 2007 before it collapsed in 2008, I, I actually went and started a bunch of individual brick and mortar stores in Nashville, Tennessee. And I was able to, to, to work those for about 10 years. And then ultimately, as I got deeper and deeper into success in those businesses, I got deeper and deeper into lawsuits because one of the things I've learned is that if you own small businesses, you wind up dealing with the legal system. And, and that's confirmed by a bunch of business owners that I, that I knew around town. And, and it's every little thing you can imagine from kind of nonsense lawsuits to employees or, and, or employ, you know, other employers or it's really kind of a never, never ending cascade. And so when I sort of decided in, in 2015 to kind of hang up my cleats and call it a day, I had sold all that stuff, spent a couple of years just kind of wandering around, drifting and unplugging and dumped all my media accounts and, and just try to enjoy life a little bit without 60 or 70 employees. And once I started writing, I'd come across this fascinating historical thing in Colombia, a historical event, which was this, a, treasure a treasure ship that had been searched for for like 300 years. And they found it. And the Colombians were incredibly excited. They were going to bring it up off the ocean floor, but they couldn't because they got sued by a bunch of people in the U.S. And it, and it really brought that whole thing back home to me. And I thought, you know what? This is an awesome treasure hunt. But instead of fighting pirates and looking through old maps, treasure hunters now are basically battling lawsuits and non-disclosure agreements. And, it, and as I sort of wrote this, this satirical novel, it just took shape like that. And so I, I incorporated a lot of locations people have probably never heard of, like Corn Island, Nicaragua, and Walge Rug, South Dakota, and places people have probably never been, like Bogota in Colombia. Uh, you know, Bogota is a, is a city that sits almost 10,000 feet up in the air. So that's almost two Denver Heights. And I mean, you think it's hard to breathe or run or do anything in Denver. Oh my gosh. Um, and it's massive. I mean, it's a city of over 10 million. So it's just one of those things that when you're in the U S and you're really insulated, you you're like, wow, there is a crazy big world out there with, with a lot of different things going on. Yeah. You, one you of the things that? you talked about, oh, go ahead. I was going to say it, your comment about Bogota actually reminds me of a trip me and TK took to Denver to do a um, like some <laughs> high school seminars and, and workshops. And TK TK couldn't take the elevation, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was messed up. That's why I live in Cartagena, <laughs> zero feet above sea level. <laughs> Yeah, I was like an NBA playoff rookie, like game seven, a rookie who had never been there before. I, I choked under the pressure, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it can be it can be tough. It can be tough. But uh, yeah, so I mean, Natch writing was just writing was just kind of a natural outgrowth of me drifting into something. Um, 
And, and it kind of goes with the theme, Kamal, that you developed for this, which is this sort of permissionless life. And, and I thought about that when I looked at, at, at how you had the show set up. And I thought, you know what? That's a really interesting thematically because you, you can't wait for permission for the people in charge because they're never going to give it. And that dates all the way back to when you couldn't push your little brother into the swimming pool and you couldn't pull your little sister's hair. You couldn't get permission for any of that. And as you get older, the fun stuff continues to be denied you because your employer's not going to say, yeah, take a month off. Yeah, you know, here's a paid vacation for, for six weeks. And so you've really got to kind of look around and, and figure out, okay, how am I going to get this done? Because the, the situation I'm in now isn't, isn't going to allow for what I want to do. So what am I going to do to change the, the parameters of the game? And that's really what I did was take a look and say, okay, the parameters of the game are I'm going to own these businesses and work and try to save for retirement until I'm 65 and my social security checks bounce to Pluto and back. And am I going to have enough money? And I just looked at the math and said, no. So I, I've got to change the whole dynamic of this. And in my case, it was, hmm. okay, well, if, if I sell everything to reduce the cost and make this more effective, is that a real reality? And, and it was. Yeah. You know, by the way, so I, I want to recommend everyone who's listening to this. There's a, um, an article you recently published on Medium called Get Out Now, Early Retirement <laughs> and, and Finding the Affordable America. And, and you, you went into depth talking about this, just about how, you know, if you wanted to do this in the United States, there, there's no way it's happening unless you have at least a million dollars. So your decision to retire early wasn't about saying, all right, I'm going to get rich quick. It was about saying, I'm going to change the way I live. I would like to hear more about this idea from you of creating wealth as, as a willingness to live more creatively rather than just as, as a necessity to, to make more money. Well, you know, I spent, as you mentioned, I'd spent a lot of years as an analyst. And one of the things you look at when you're an analyst is everything is shaded in terms of value. Is this a good value? Is this, this $10 coffee that much better than $2 coffee? And when you look at the costs associated with the U.S., the deal in America was always that our infrastructure was so far ahead that it was worth paying for. And when I started to look around, I started to say, you know what? A lot of countries have caught up and that deal isn't mm -hmm. as worthwhile as it used to be. And so I started looking at the U.S. like a stock and said, is this a good value? You know, for me, it, it really wasn't. I mean, I, I love the U.S. It's my home country. I just don't know that I could afford to live in the U.S. and kind of do what I'm doing now and the things I like doing. So, so in the end, that, that played a big role in it. And, you know, as, as you guys know, and as a lot of your listeners probably know, if you're comfortable in your sort of home situation and your life situation, where you live, the things you do, you're generally going to be pretty happy. But if you don't really like, if you live in Atlanta and you don't really like Atlanta, nothing's going to work so well. So you've really got to find a place where you're comfortable and then everything else kind of falls into place. And, and for me that, you know, I, I, I just didn't feel comfortable because I always felt a little bit like I was just getting ripped off phone insurance, pizza insurance, you know, that's just a little much for me. <laughs> you know, Vic, we've talked about in the past <clears throat> how, how hard getting out can be how hard escaping um, this this kind of world and the structure that we've been placed in. You know, one of the things you've referenced is in the past is that like you're a taxpayer. This system isn't just going to let you walk away for free. Like you, there are things that are set in place that prevent you um, from getting out. And so I think I'd like to hear you talk a little bit more about how you were able to, to make this transition. Um, you know, were, were there... And obviously you, you were a business owner, but I'm sure there were things in place that didn't want to give you the permission to get out, that didn't want to give you the permission to, to, to live life on your own terms. And, and I'd like to hear you kind of talk about you know, what that looked like as you were battling some of those forces. Well, you know, it comes in a lot of varieties. And as I said, and, and as we talked about that, 
it's hard to really pinpoint one specific thing because I, I've met several people over the course of the years down here and not everybody, but most people have this similar ghost in the machine story where somewhere along the road of getting out, the system sort of tried to hook them back in. Uh, one hmm. guy who couldn't get a passport renewed, you know, zero underlying crimes or owed taxes or anything. It just twice the passport application got lost. And, and so obviously you can't go anywhere until that gets ironed out. And, you know, a lot of flights get canceled or you, you know, some kind of strange bill pops up and you can't quite afford it. And so it's, it's a mental state. In a lot of cases, it's a physical issue. You know, I actually had a lawsuit come out of nowhere from someone I'd never met as I was sort of preparing to leave. And so I was stuck in the U S for months arguing over that and fighting over that until I finally just said, I'm done. I left with the lawsuit sort of hanging and I don't have an address. So <laughs> I, I'm not entirely sure how anyone can get in touch with me to, to, to make the lawsuit proceed. But in the end, that was for me, I finally just had had enough and said, I, I'm not, I'm not waiting for the system to give me permission to get out of here. I'm leaving. And if you guys want, you know, to get a piece of me, however you want, you can come do that. But I, I'm not going to do it where you can readily find me and, and make my life difficult. So mm. and I have no idea what's transpired with that lawsuit since. I mean, for all I know, the next time I cross back into the U.S., I'm, I'm going to be handcuffed. Uh, but <laughs> certainly wouldn't be the first time. But but yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I'd, I'd love to also hear about you were on a pretty traditional path. You went to Auburn, you got your degree in finance. Um, you, you look like it was a pretty straightforward path in the business. And so, you know, what did, what did becoming an entrepreneur look like to you? Was it like the, re, the inner rebel in you that said, I want to do things my way or, or, you know, what was it? Like, how did you kind of come to this place that I'm going to break the mode? I'm going to go my own direction. And, you know, screw the, the conventional wisdom? That is a very good question. Um, because I was on a very traditional trajectory and a successful one, actually. Uh, I think I was the youngest guy doing my job for the firm by something like 20 years. And it, at one point, I really looked around and said, I'm making a lot of money in this industry. I, I'm in, say, at that point, I was in sort of the sales side of it. So I don't create anything. I don't manufacture anything. I, I sort of make money off transactions and they didn't feel really good because it just didn't feel like I'm accomplishing much and it didn't feel like I was really adding much. So I was a little sickened by that to be quite frank about it. And I looked around at the other people that had been doing it in, in other companies for years and it wasn't a life I wanted. I mean, on an airplane, 220 days a year, a lot of people had difficult home situations if they had them at all because of the constant travel. And I walked away from a job very few people would walk away from. And I, I just thought, you know, I, I see where this is going to go and I don't want to be there. And it, I guess I applied that same mentality when I was getting out of the U.S. and out of the small business universe because I saw where that was going, at least in my personal situation. And I just, I didn't want to be there when it ended. So I, I'd rather be somewhere else. And, and so that's really, those were the decisions that drove me, which is if you think of the career path you're on or the personal path you're taking, push it out 15, 20 years. Look at the people that have done that job or where they are now. If those are lives that you want to have, okay. But if those are not lives that you want to have, you got to make a change. Victor, the answer to this might be no, but I'm wondering if there's a way to apply this mindset for people who don't want to leave the country. I imagine there are a lot of people who may, they haven't had that level of international travel. The thought of leaving the country and living somewhere so far away from family seems intimidating, overwhelming, and lonely, and they're committed to staying in the U.S., Given the fact that the bar is so much higher here to be wealthy if you want to retire early, is there anything that people who are committed to staying in this country can do? Well, you know, I'm not in the U.S., so I don't know the on the ground facts. I only know the crazy headlines we get down here, um, which 
paints a pretty funny picture. Uh, well, sad picture actually, but, uh, I guess in that instance, what I would say is find less expensive places, find less regulated states, find less regulated and expensive areas, uh, because you can't solve the total problem, but you can solve a big piece of it. And to give you an example of that, I don't own a car. I haven't owned a car in almost five years, which means I don't fill my car up with gas. It means I don't pay car insurance. It means I don't have to fix my car and, and all of those associated expenses. And that's, that's one of the pieces of the puzzle that traps you in, on the trajectory that you're on. And so, yeah, I think you can solve it to a degree by minimizing a lot of that overhead. But I think you're, I think you're taking NyQuil for your cold. I think you're treating the symptoms and mm. not the overall problem, not, not completely. And, and obviously it varies for individual people. But I think on a lot of levels, for a lot of people, you're treating the symptoms and not the root cause. Uh, I mean, if you're if you're if you guys would just sit down and pencil out everything you pay in insurances and look at that compared to what you pay in rent, for example, it's mind boggling that that large of a percentage of your money goes to an intangible item. And, and that's part of what kind of forces you into that trajectory. And I mean, you're, in, in a lot of instances in the U.S., you're forced to, you know, car insurance is mandatory. And so this goes back to Kamal's theme, which is you're never going to get permission not to have that. And so to me, you know, I, I'm, I'm just hard headed. You know, if you're going to tell me I can't do something, it's the first thing I'm going to do. I'm five years old. So. So if you want to be rich and retire early. Besides making an MBA, coming up with a crazy startup idea, leave the country. Is that right? Well, <laughs> I would just say this. You don't necessarily have to be rich to retire early outside of the U.S. And, and that's an interesting message that people should ponder. But I do think that if the notion is of early retirement without necessarily being rich, uh, quite frankly, the math, the mathematics don't support that inside the U.S., um, and that doesn't mean everyone needs to leave. I'm just saying you either understand that your retirement is going to look a lot different than your current lifestyle. And mm. unless you make an awful lot of money or that's it. I mean, you see a lot of middle class teachers and people like that moving to Mexico and places like that for retirement because you don't think about it when you're 25 or when you're 30. But when you start to get old like me and you're into your 40s, you start looking around and saying, you know, this whole retirement thing isn't that far off. So mm. how, how am I going to do that? Yeah, it, it's, it's a real you challenge. Uh, I mean, the value in the U.S. is the I mean, cost of living is really re guys. It's really sky high there. And when you travel around, you realize, holy cow, that's really sky high. Yeah. You, you hinted at it a little bit when you talked about not having a car and having to worry about the upkeep of all these physical <laughs> possessions. I'm, I'm curious to know more about your idea of what it means to be rich. Another excellent question. And I thought about that yesterday as well. To <laughs> me, what it means to be rich is being able to do what I want to do without money being a massive concern. Um, mm. I, I, I'm never going to be Bill Gates. I'm never going to be, you know, you know, name your billionaire. Um, and for, I think most people, they, you know, when you're younger, you really do think that somewhere in the back of your head, you always believe I'm going to make that kind of money. And once you, you know, when you're 40 and you're looking around and you're saying, well, there went 20 years, I didn't make that kind of money. The question is, <laughs> am I going to make that kind of money in the second half? Um, and so to me, it, it became less about chasing the dream and more about chasing the reality. And for me, the reality led me here. Um, that's not to say you're, you're giving up on a dream. It's to say the dream maybe needs to be a little more realistic as you, as you approach your later years. If you sort of haven't done what you hoped and thought you would do, you got to adjust. You, you can't keep living. You know, if you can't shoot a jump shot, you're probably not going to learn if you just keep doing it, keep doing it, and you keep not hitting it, you, you've got to learn, okay, I got to try something different. 
You know, in that same vein, you, you talked about regulations and we've talked about a lot of times in this conversation, just permission. What does freedom mean to you? It's life on my schedule. And, and I mean, that's it. That That is my definition. It is life on my schedule and the ability to kind of do what I want to do and the things that are fun and happy. Um, and it's, and it's back to TK's question, which is what does being rich mean? And to me, if you're, you know, and the stock answer people always say is, well, if you're doing something you love and that's true in a lot of ways. And so if you are doing something you love, if, if you love reviewing books or you love reviewing movies, then you may, you know, you may live paycheck to paycheck, but you're, you're kind of rich in a lot of ways. And so what I did was essentially take money out of the equation by moving somewhere where it's substantially less important. But for people that are in the U S I would say that, that you can try to find places that are less expensive to help reduce that cost and, and find something you really enjoy doing and, and recognize that if you're one of the people that's lucky enough to love what you're doing and like what you're doing, you're doing pretty well. You're, you're, you're way above the average in the universe. You, you also said um, something about, you know, when it comes to your dreams, having to adjust them, having if you're if you're at a place in life where um, you might have projected that you were farther and, you know, you need to sit down and you, you need to adjust your dreams. I, I, I think that's good advice, but I'm, I've also heard like a lot of wisdom or just like a lot of opinions about being realistic, how that can be harmful to your potential, how um, in, in, in some way it can, it can be, it can help, it can sabotage your mindset. Like if you're, you're too focused on being realistic, uh, you can't ever dream up a crazy life, like living in Medellin, Colombia or living in uh, Cartagena, Colombia. So, you know, <laughs> I, I often refer to um, Will Smith. He, he said, being realistic is the most commonly traveled road to mediocrity. And I'm curious to hear you juxtapose your position on being realistic. Okay, that's a, that's a really good point. And, and I guess the way I mean it probably applies more to time horizon than it does about your dream. And so if you're at a job, you know, people used to always ask in job interviews, where do you see yourself in 10 years? And I don't like that question. What I like is, where are you going to take this? To, what's the next level of this job? And then the next level after that, and maybe the third level after that. So play chess with your, with your employment world. Where do I want to be two or three jobs from now? And if you've got the work ethic, which to me is the central driver of success in life and in work and in everything else, if you've got the work ethic and you get there, then you can say, okay, now what are we going to do? And then you plan out, where do I go from here? Where do I go from here? Because I, I think in some ways, one of the problems is if you set your sights on this goal that's really, really far off, it's hard to bite off the chunks that get you there. And it's the chunks that get you there when you sort of see success from A to B to C. To me, that's, that's the motivator. I, I mean, if I get a position I wanted, I'm really, really happy about that. I'm not thinking about, I'm still not at my long-term goal. I'm thinking, man, I, I just got a job way before I was supposed to. That's awesome. Now, where do I go? And so to me, when I say realistic, I, I guess I misphrased that a little bit. What I mean is, as it relates to time, bite it off in chunks of time that are realistic. Where do I want to be in two to three years with this job? Where do I want to be in two to three years with my living situation or my life. And I think that way it allows you a little more flexibility because three jobs from now, you make a bunch of money and you pay off all your debts. And I don't know about you guys, but I spent a lot of years as a young person in debt. And the minute you pay off all those debts, your entire universe view shifts. When you don't owe anyone money, it, you will never look at life the same way. Because then it is, wow, I really do have the freedom to make a decision I want to make. I have the freedom to walk away from a great job. I have the freedom to do what I want to do. And so, you know, in terms of life goals, for people that are in debt, I would say that's, that's one of the biggest targets. All right, how do I get out of this? Then where do I want to go after that? Victor, here's my final question for you. 
when we talk about this idea of not waiting for permission, one of the biggest things that makes people feel as if they are imprisoned to conditions they don't want is the political system that they happen to live in. At least half the country is feeling like they're in a political system that doesn't accommodate who they are. And then the other half is living in fear that those people are going to be sufficiently motivated to acquire political power in the next run. And then they'll be the ones that feel like they're in a system that doesn't accommodate who they are. So there's always this seesaw battle between I'm I'm unhappy with the political system I live in or I'm afraid that the political system I live in is about to change in a negative way. What advice do you have to people who want to adopt this philosophy of permissionless living in spite of these powerful political forces that seem to say, nope, you can't have your dream because I'm president or because my group of people are in charge. As a general rule, I try not to view politicians as, as deities or anyone to look up to because quite frankly, there are people that, that for a living don't tell the truth. And a lot of what they do is really just theater to keep us entertained and sort of to keep people angry or, or whatever they whatever they you're trying to do, and I, in a in a very small way, I address this in the last one out because this is a little bit of a spoiler. But the villainess in the book, who runs her business based on, if you're familiar with TSA, if you travel, TSA used to spend an awful lot of time taking things out of your luggage, saying it was a violation. And so her business is running a black market, Amazon.com, based on everything that the TSA has stolen. They just resell all that stuff around the world. And she winds up, in order to hide her fortune, she winds up hiding it by becoming a U.S. senator. And, and that kind of encapsulates my view of it, which mm -hmm. is, here's someone that uh, is someone that's, that it, people have told me is fun to read about, is fun to root for and if, to root against. And ultimately, they wind up in the Senate. And once you're there, there's not much you can really do to them. Um, so I think politics is going to be what it is. They're going to fight over each other and fight over power. But at the individual level, it really doesn't impact you a huge amount. Um, I, I mean, it does at the macro level. But at the micro level, did anything change drastically in 20, when was that, 2017 when Trump was elected? I mean, the sky didn't fall the next day. And when Barack Obama was elected the first time, we heard the exact same thing from the other side. The sky didn't fall the next day. Everybody went on with their lives. Maybe it was a little easier for some. Maybe it was a little harder for some. But in the end, if you're focused on what they're doing, you're never going to accomplish anything because they're just putting on a show for you. And you need to put on a show for you. You need to work and, and try to accomplish your goals because they're just not going to do it for you. Words to the wise. And for those who feel like, because I know they're out there, Victor, for those who feel like, but the sky did fall. The sky really did fall when Obama got elected. The sky really did fall, I tell you, when Trump got elected. To those people, I say, you know what? Even if you choose to believe that the sky fell when that happened, all right. When the results are in, that's it. OK, you, you showed up and you cast your vote and you rooted for the person. You either got them or you didn't. So now what? Now what? Now what are you going to do? Are you going to sit back and treat your power as if it's something that doesn't matter for another four years until you can vote again? Or are you going to live as if there is a way to create meaning and freedom in everyday life, irrespective of what's going on with politicians? You know, TK, I always say and, and I think a lot of people would probably agree with this. People are at their best when they're laughing or listening to music. When you're listening to music or you're laughing, you're in a better place mentally, almost always, when you think back over your life. And that's one of the reasons I write humor and satire is because if that makes people laugh, if that gets them out of that funk of listening to politicians and politics and getting down, then that's great. Uh, that's what I hope to do. So, uh, you know, if, and if you're not spending your time listening to music and laughing, you're a little too serious and you need to take a step back and remember what it's like to laugh and have fun. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You, you got to learn how to enjoy your freedom while you fight for it. Victor, thank you so yep. much, man, for, for joining us and sharing your insights. This was really awesome. For those of you who are listening, you can follow Victor on Twitter 
at right underscore Vic Adams. And be sure to check out the book on Amazon. Uh, it's called The Last One Out. And you can go to his website also at VicAdams.com. You can check out the section of books for sale to buy it there. He's also got some really great articles where he talks about a lot of the concepts that we discussed here. We'll see you next time, tomorrow, 12 p.m. Eastern time for TK's Two Cents. Peace out, revolutionaries. Victor, thanks for joining us again. Gracias, chicos.